Well, if you think of um, when you get an inharmony between two people, well, um, they either talk it over and come to um, an acceptable situation of harmony between them, or if that's not possible, they move apart. I mean, they might do it subtly by simply not meeting each other so often, and in fact, not at all in the end. They may do it, if you like, strengthen this gap by moving away from each other so that contact is, is minimal to zero. Now, it, this doesn't prove, in some sense, either of them is right or wrong. It simply says that within their capacities they were not able to find a harmony that kept them together. So they moved apart. One moved away, or both moved away from each other. Now, uh, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one situation. It can be a one-to-a-group. But the same applies. The group now constitutes acting as if um, it was something like a person and decides, you know, may take such steps to um, negotiate with each other, may not, may feel that it's gone beyond that, it's not going to, or it's only going to negotiate on certain terms. And if you don't meet these requirements, then, you know, you're out, you're an outsider, you're not related to, or you're minimally related to, or even hostilely related to, to keep you at bay. And so if you want harmony now, well, you have to move away from, uh, you have to cut off whether you wish to or not. You now do wish to because of the inharmony that you're being presented with or if you like a compromise from your point of view to something that you feel is um, too damaging to your selfhood. So you leave, you know, uh, the group is bigger than the individual in as regards uh, resources and, and options in some ways. And um, so if you can, you take the opportunity of leaving. If you can't, then you may have to put up with the inharmony, compromise and stay within, but with this constant inharmony, which will be destructive from your point of view, but not as destructive, presumably, as trying to quit where you couldn't or where you could, but the cost of quitting is, um, if you like, hunger and starvation, you know, it's not an option in a sense. So you don't necessarily get people um, parting because of inharmony. You may find that they, they compromise. They um, remain with the inharmony which may be overt until the organization, the group, throw you out, or maybe ongoing and a constant thorn in the flesh to you. So you're, it's incentive to ever look for a way out, isn't it? And this is solution to find a way out. Again, we're not saying that either it, the group or the individual is right or wrong. We're not judging here. We're simply saying is, what is the, the best outcome given the situation? From each party's point of view to stay, and if that is an option, or depart. Now you may, when you, if you take yourself away, um, 
well, you're making it impossible in a sense, in a side you do keep yourself away with the other to put things right. Well, you may leave the option open that if someone truly came to you as you felt um, trying to put things right, then you would talk it over with them. But you may not uh, think this is the case. You may think, no, they're just um, going to try and prove me wrong and then uh, exclude me because of it. Um, so it might be best to um, avoid the whole process and just part cut them off from yourself, assuming you had the option. So Jesus isn't preaching to those that don't have ears to hear, and um, he's moving away from such when he preaches, like, you know, he's, he's, he's talking to a crowd of people that do wish to hear, of course. There may be enemies, you know, people in the crowd who are just trying to fault everything he says. As regards harmony, he could move further away. You know, he could um, constantly travel from one um, location to another out of the domain of those that are hostile to him, constantly move on. If you feel the costs of um, separation are just unacceptable, just too high, then you remain with the group, you know, be it a society or neighborhood, whatever it is, or, or you're trapped in, say, a prison or um, uh, an employment situation, which um, the alternatives are just too bad to tolerate, and you now outwardly conform you obey. So obedience can be a harmonious solution in the sense that it's more harmonious than not obeying and uh, getting the suffering the consequences from the group accordingly. So some or many members of the group may be there in this, if you like, compromising situation. In general, how does one choose whether to remain with a group or not? Well, what are the advantages and disadvantages of being with or, or not being with? And, and you weigh one against the other, don't you? Um, basically, the situation is that you're getting pressure from someone or some group because you keep doing what they don't like. And they're um, responding by um, wanting you to do otherwise. <laughs> and that might be expressed in very hostile ways. Now the group or individual can be defending themselves in that what you're doing they see as destructive to them. So they're trying to separate themselves from you if you won't stop doing what you're doing. And they may try to separate themselves from you in a very hostile way, of course. And so you being presented with this, act accordingly. You either vanish or you have a war, whichever you think is going to produce the best outcome. Um, are there guiding principles in deciding what's best to do? Mm, if you like. Much of religious teaching is um, uh, even in the face of wrong, not to do wrong. But equally, it's not wise to simply tolerate wrongness, if you like, damage being done to yourself. To remain in the firing line is not advisable in general. To 
compromise with evil is not advisable in general. Basically, you're going to seek avoidance rather than retaliation. Do you see it? Avoidance is not the same as obedience and submission to. But it's not the same as retaliation either. So basically the solution is, well, retire, let them get on with it, be it group or individual. Separate yourself. You're called out from. You know, in, in the story, Christian flees from the city of destruction. And by destruction he sees it as his own destruction if he stays. Jesus does not flee. He actually moves to the city of destruction. He goes up to Jerusalem to get crucified for a reason. It's not sure that you have the same reason for doing so. It's not at all clear that you are supposed to do the same. How many people do you need to be crucified? And in that sense, one um, example of sacrifice is enough. And thank God it's a story, not a, a deliberate reality. What's the difference between a story and a reality? Well, the physical pain and suffering didn't actually occur if it's a story. But if it's a history, true, and a reality, then it did, and that's just terrible. It's bad enough as a story. <laughs> but in the story, we have the good outcome without the bad reality. You're moved by the story. It illustrates to you compassion and a great motivation to love that which is good and protect the innocent, I might say. We want with all our heart for this story not to be true. We don't want the hero to be crucified. That's just an awful outcome. So it both grabs our attention to the story and has a wonderful consequence. And thank God it's not a physical reality. And I mean literally, thank God. Thank you, Heavenly Father. It is not true in the physical world sense. And that if people do follow such example in reality, well they're misguided. It's not a it's not what's wanted. We don't want our children to suffer and be crucified for goodness sake. Any any loving parent could tell you that. In fact, got a feeling any parent could tell you that. <laughs> Whether they're the epitome of loving kindness or not. <laughs> well, I don't think there's many exceptions anyway. So in all said and done, it's not a complicated problem. If it's better for you to leave the company of a group or an individual, well, fine. If you can't, well, what's the most harmonious solution? In the limit, you can form utterly to what's being asked of you. You know, if you live in a, a racially segregated society, it may be asked of you that you conform to the regulation. And uh, even though, you know, I had a friend who was white South African, he was interrogated for 90 days because he supported the black cause, not the white. And um, in the end it was 
just impossible for him. And he left the country, and thank goodness he did, because he, he lectured me, you know. He was one of my lecturers at uni, university. And a very fine chap he was, too. He did the right thing, and when it was possible to go back to South Africa, as history unrolled, he did. And um, lectured there. Associate professor, whatever he was there. Good on him. And I think he did the right thing. He, he was not a Christian guy, although his, his parents were. Um, but he uh, was, in an ethical way, quite marvellous. I don't wish to give praise to man, but he was a good friend, really good friend. So you may stay and not conform and suffer a bit too much and have to leave. Or not leave, but just conform. Keep your mouth shut that as regards some of the abominations around you, within it. There you go. Thank you, Dad. Thank you for it as it is. Looks a bit messy, but then childhood isn't always that clean and tidy, is it? <laughs> but he loves us through, and our faith and our trust is in him. Bless you. Thank you, Dad. Well, very often we just don't fancy leaving, but we do want to hang on to whatever we're doing that annoys the party or person we're with. Um, hmm. In a sense, you could praise God in either circumstance and trust him. And if, of course, you can't trust him in one but can in the other, then you take the other, whichever that is. Could be compromised, could be leaving. When you actually get into the situation, well, instead of becoming too difficult, it usually becomes manageable in some way. We trust him for it, you see. In this regard, of course, what really matters is that we've had a such a great experience of trusting him in our lives that trusting him is just second nature to us. First nature, in fact. We just do it. So some people are extremely peaceful in what you would have thought was impossible situations, but it's not for them. And other people are peaceful in leaving difficult situations. There are uncertainties, but they're just able to embrace such because of a trust in God in, in un, unusual circumstances. But a life of trust is likely to lead to trust in more circumstances. And you're going to be trusting God not to give you certain really bad circumstances or to give you a way out in such cases. And if this is your experience in life, then this um, option is that much the more real to you. No, there's a fundamental um, understanding here that's helpful, and that is that it's all thought 
you can be suffering in a, a dream because you're dreaming accordingly. And the thought can change and you're not dreaming. Practice making your trust of God always absolutely the first thing that's in your mind. And the mind will be controlled. The mind is either occupied trusting God or is not. So practice occupying the mind with the trust of God. I might point out here that the practice of thankfulness does this. Every difficult situation, you rush in, thank you, Heavenly Father. And it's the thought of God and all that's associated with God that then occupies the mind. And it's the mind that is determining what seems to be the reality. So the practice of thankfulness is the practice of the mind being anchored to God in all the goodness that that God means to you. So this is your practice in living. Do you get very good at it? In other words, the presence of God becomes your eternal presence, which is of course exactly what you want. That's called heaven. because of his power and his loving kindness. You see, it's God that is everything to us. He is our rescue, our salvation. Not we ourselves. It is him. Perhaps what we need to say to ourselves above all things, always, is thank you, Heavenly God, for your loving care and rescue of us. You are our rescue. Your thoughts are our rescue. Not my own. Yours. You, not just in me, but in all things, is my rescue. In other words, to always take your mind off the problem, on to God is your great practice. We do it by saying, Oh, thank you, Father. Your presence, your healing, your rescue. Thank you for your life eternal. Thank you for your freedom your light, your glory, your joy, your fullness of life and loveliness eternal. Thank you, God, for your light ever with and in me. Your kindness, your loveliness, my God, dearest friend, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you.
you that. It occurs to me that we are not the body. We are spirit. We are not to identify with being the body. The body simply disintegrates and goes back to being disaggregated matter. We are spirit. Hold to this reality of who you are. Don't be deceived that it's the body. For instance, the body you now have is not the body you had seven years ago. Mm. Perhaps nearly all the cells have changed since then. And the matter comprising them. They are different cells. They have the same pattern as before. That's what's made the ongoing continuity of physical life. But they are not you. You're not identified with the body. You're identified with spirit. I am he, I am he. Blessed spirit, I am he. And my spirit has always communed with God because God is everywhere, just as my spirit is everywhere with him. We are embraced, blended, ever in the company of the infinite fullness of God. It is your view of God that matters, you see. That this is your reality. His personhood. Ever blended with yours. Thank God there is no escape from him. No desire to ever be from him. This is paradise to be with our perfect, all-capable, all-embracing friend. Nothing exists but for his will. And his will is to love and care for us. And that's reflected in our will too to love and care for him. You see, you're going to live in a fashion that makes life the reality of being with him. That this is reality. It's not the body, it's not your tiny experience in your tiny speck of an uncertain universe. You have become preoccupied to this as if it's the be-all and end-all of your reality. It's not. Your spirit in the presence of your heavenly Father who is spirit. who holds all reality as he chooses. It's simply according to what he thinks. So our refuge is in his personhood, not my previous view of my own personhood. I am not the body. I am the personhood. which is evidenced by my mind thinking of his
his mind, which is a part of his mind, thinking his mind. I and my father are one. These scriptures are, can be a great blessing if we attend to them. We find answers, we find leading, we find rescue. That's why they're written. They are writings that are created with good intent to rescue you. They're not perfectly written. You can avail yourself of them because they help you to perfectly practice. You see, to fundamentally own in your personhood, in your whole practice of living, that God is your heavenly dad. You're holding the reality of kind, loving, all-powerful dad. You are. You are not the cause of your existence. He is. What an astonishing miracle that from nothing he brings you into existence. is in his hands, especially yours. Your very existence is the evidence of that, for you are not existing of yourself, but because he has willed such. It is his personhood and joy. determines all, your existence and everything else. So you live in the habit and reality of that. It's infinitely better than any other option. Thank you, Dad, wonderful one. Thank you for your love. Your love not just of us, but of all. May I live every moment that you give me in that reality, Lord. Utterly devoted to you, Father. You and only you. I may delight in the love of you. In your loveliness and your presence always. I identify. you. No one else, nothing else. I identify utterly with you, Lord. Wonderful one. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Dad.
Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad.